time of the First World War, specialization in anesthesia was not recognized as it is today. That being so, Sir Ivan, why did you decide to devote your whole time to giving anesthetics? Well, it's a very simple story, uh, so As a student, before qualification, I was interested in anaesthetics because I could see that once one was qualified as a doctor, you were expected to give an anaesthetic for any kind of operation, no matter how serious it was, although you might not be expected to do the surgery. You know, of course, that uh, when you were qualified in those early days, the amount of training you had was negligible. And I myself can produce for you here a certificate to show that on qualification as MV, I had administered one anaesthetic. That gives you an idea of uh, the amount of training we had in those days and what a formidable proposition it was in the future for me. At the end of the uh, first war, um, I was posted to a small hospital in Barnet for lack of a better job to do. And I got to giving the anaesthetic for some simple procedures there with uh, the old fashioned methods of the drop bottle and the, the mask. There were no complicated cases to deal with. But it so happened that there was a demand from the ADMS to know whether he could post an anaesthetist from this hospital to a place called Sidcup. When I got there, I found that um, the proposition was a formidable one because this hospital contained some 700 beds occupied entirely by men who had been wounded in the face and jaws in the first war. And they were under the care of uh, Sir Hyle, the late Sir Harold Gillies, who did so much in the plastic field. The methods of giving anaesthetics were very simple at that time, in that hospital even. They used um, ship the apparatus to vaporize ether and the Hewitt's airway, but the difficulty of maintaining an airway over a period sometimes of four hours was a, a very strenuous business for the anaesthetist, for the surgeon and for the patient. Because, you see, with the airway not completely free, it meant that you were encroaching very often on the aseptic field. Well, Rubotham and I discovered that the, the answer was complete control of the airway, and we achieved this by means of uh, the endotracheal tube. I do not claim that we invented the endotracheal anesthesia, but it was not in common use when we joined the hospital there. However, uh, we used this uh, method, uh, namely an um, insufflation technique with a catheter and uh, a motor to blow ether vapor into the patient's lungs after the catheter had been inserted. At first, we passed the catheter through the mouth and uh, there was a certain amount of uh, outflow from the trachea with the pletum system, as you can imagine, and the surgeon was very often embarrassed by the spray of blood, which uh, was necessary to keep the blood from entering the trachea. We solved that problem by putting a second tube into the trachea to provide for expiration. And in that manner, we could divert the patient's expirations entirely away from the surgeon. And the fangs could be packed with gauze, which meant that there was no spray of blood. That was the first technique we used. But there was a demand for nitrous oxide and oxygen, and uh, we found that it was expensive to use it by the insufflation technique. It required so many gallons an hour that it was quite expensive. Uh, eventually, however, we found that the solution of the matter was the use of one wide bore tube passed into the trachea and connected by means of a wide bore a corrugated tube to a gas bag and uh, an expiratory valve incorporated. And in that way, you could use um, gas and oxygen for maintenance of anesthesia as well as for induction. Blind intubation, which you introduced there, had other advantages as well. Yes, it had a very different advantage. At first, as you know, we passed the tube through the uh, nose in order to give the surgeon free access to the floor of the mouth and the lower jaw without encumbering them in any way. But we found that with the patient's head in the right position, you could put the tube into the trachea through the nose by what I called the blind method. And that became very, very popular indeed. The tube could be passed into the trachea without the use of laryngoscope at all. The advantage of that was very obvious because in order to pass the tube into the trachea by direct vision with a laryngoscope in those days when there were no muscular relaxants, it meant inducing a depth of anesthesia in the patient which was really greater than that required for the operation itself.
so that it was particularly advantageous to the patient. What sort of machines did you have at that time? Uh, the machines were all primitive. There was a Boyle's machine which uh, operated uh, with um, a water sight feed, which was not by, by no means accurate and did not provide for the necessary flows. And there was a bottle, uh, an ether bottle, uh, on that so that you could add uh, vap ether vapour if you wished. Was nitrous oxide readily available at that time? It was available, and uh, of course uh, we used it in the hospital. But uh, when eventually I went into private practice, I found that the, the, the price of it at eight and sixpence a hundred gallons was prohibitive. When you consider that the fees that we, uh, we got as a recompense in those early days, it was not a paying proposition. However, there was a demand for it, as you know, for induction as opposed to the old-fashioned method of giving ether, and uh, one had to use it. Well, my solution of it was, having no motor car, I borrowed two hundred gallon cylinders weighing eleven pounds each, and uh, I took these down uh, in the same way as one enters the jug and bottle counter. I took them down to Baths in Poland Street. They were the people who made the gas in those days. And I got them filled, and I took them out all hot, and I took them away onto my overcoat, and uh, I was then able to give gas and oxygen at any rate for induction of anesthesia. Where did you get your endotracheal tubes? Well, at first it was very difficult to get material that was suitable for um, passing into the trachea. You see, you take uh, ordinary drainage tube, which is soft. It uh, hadn't got the necessary qualities. But I found that uh, commercial rubber tubing, which is used for um, gas and that kind of thing, uh, had the necessary characteristics. It was thin in the wall, and at a certain amount of resistance to external pressure. I had to get this from an old rubber shop in Tottenham Court Road, and these people stood me in good stead. Moreover, the uh, rubber was stored in coils, which gave it a natural curve, as you see, which lent itself uh, very well to um, the air passages. And to make a tube was a very simple matter. All you had to do was uh, cut off the uh, end at an angle of 45 degrees like that, and uh, take a piece of any rough stuff like emery paper, and take off the edges like that, and uh, when you got it smoothed off, well, you had an inlet key and tube, you cut off the necessary length. If you like, you could put it into the bronchus, or you could simply put it into the trachea. But these tubes had the necessary qualities. Well, of course, there was a demand for these tubes, and uh, it was difficult at first to um, get the manufacturers to uh, deal with the situation. Charles King, of the British Oxygen Company now, he was very helpful in that way, and he enlisted the help of the rubber companies who produced miles of tubing which was of no use whatsoever. He had some girls uh, cutting off the pieces and soldering the ends and smoothing them off and that kind of thing, and he sold them, but they weren't very good. However, the rubber companies eventually tumbled to the fact that this was a saleable proposition, and I can tell you it is. <coughs> the net result is that tubes are now available uh, all over the world, uh, not only cut off a coil like that, but moulded as any other rubber appliance is, properly moulded and vulcanised uh, to the right degree. The control of the larynx opened up a completely fresh field in surgery. Now, for example, you take children. I was quite afraid at first about intubating children, and there was a lot of difficulty in getting tubes of the right size for the very small opening of the larynx. However, I was uh, ably supported by Sir Harry Gillies. He was always intent on new methods if they were any use. And I can remember uh, on one occasion, I think it was in 1924, I gave an anaesthetic at Great Ormond Street for Sir Harold to do a hair lip and cleft palate uh, with an endotracheal anaesthetic, and I believe it was the first time that it had been used in that hospital. Well, nowadays, you find that intubation is uh, used for practically every operation in Great Ormond Street. Then, of course, in other fields, you take uh, the surgery of the chest. Uh, in intrathoracic work, it was highly important to have some control of the larynx, during these uh, intrathoracic manipulations. In those early days, when I was at Brompton Hospital, the uh, patients were very often um, full of secretion. They were very wet. And I, oh, I felt at the time that uh, when the patient was in the operative position, there was always a risk that the secretions would be driven uh, by the surgeon's manipulations from the affected lung over to the sound one. 
For that reason, I developed um, a suction catheter with a, a balloon mounted on it, and that was passed into the trachea independently of the endotracheal tube. This worked very well. It was a simple device, and I believe it is still used. Of course, there have been other developments since then. And even so, the necessity for a device of that kind probably no longer holds good, because uh, we do not get the same kind of clinical situation with a large amount of secretions owing to uh, postural drainage and antibiotics and so forth. Were any complications blamed on intubation? Yes, of course they were. Instrumentation of any kind involves the risk of trauma, doesn't it? So that if you uh, pass an instrument into the trachea, whether it be a soft tube or a forceps or a metal tube, doesn't matter what it is, if there's any reaction afterwards, it's sure to be blamed on the anaesthetist. However, uh, with uh, practice, uh, of course, you, you find that the more experienced the uh, anaesthetist is, the less of the incidence of complications of that kind. However, in the early days of intubation, with this wide board tube that I have shown you, um, I used to find that it was advantageous to have control of the larynx and many uh, an abdominal operation. But at that time, the surgeons were averse to any complicated method of anesthesia. They preferred the open mask and the drop bottle, a very simple method, which was, of course, effective. But I used to cheat a little bit because I passed the tube blindly when the surgeon was not looking or the attendant uh, general practitioner. I put on the mask, I anesthetized the patient with an endotracheal to and fro anesthetic, and at the end of the operation, I removed the mask and the tube at the same time, and nobody knew that the patient had been intubated. <laughs> Uh, so I got the benefit of uh, control of the larynx in that way. Yes, it, it's quite clear that endotracheal intubation is one of the most valuable assets that we have in modern anaesthesia. But of course, the advances in drugs and equipment were not sufficient in themselves. There had to be people trained to use them. That's quite true. In fact, it occurred to me that we must depart from the basis where any newly qualified doctor should be deemed capable of giving an anaesthetic for any operation. And for that reason, I thought that the only thing we could do was to establish ourselves as specialists. This is in 1931. I was secretary of the section of anaesthetics in the Royal Society of Medicine, which was the only body devoted to anaesthesia in the British Islands at that time. And I approached the council, asking their permission that I should explore the possibility of having a diploma established. The council granted me permission. And I went to the Secretary of the Royal Society of Medicine, who dismissed me curtly with the information that under the terms of the Charter, nothing could be done through the Royal Society of Medicine. I reported back despondently to the Council, and at this juncture, Dr. Harry Featherstone said, uh, obviously, the solution of the problem lies in the establishment of an outside body with that object in view the Association of Anaesthetists was established, and the diploma eventually came into being in 1935. I can well remember the rules for the diploma being made by the late Joseph Bromfield and the late John Chalice, and myself as convener, we made the first rules for the diploma in anaesthetics. So that by the beginning of the Second World War, there was already available in this country a substantial body of trained anaesthetists and it made a vast difference to the condition of casualties or wounded in, in the field. There's no doubt about it that many lives were saved because we had expert anaesthetists available to deal with them uh, on the spot. It's amazing to reflect that intubation has now become a thing of the greatest ease even for the inexperienced anaesthetist. Uh, in fact, it is interesting to reflect now that if you uh, ask uh, uh, um, a candidate for the DA examination, what are the difficulties of intubation? He will say, there are none. They have been removed. However, I may tell you that whatever these developments may be, there's no doubt about it that I will allow any surgeon I know to uh, take off my leg if it were necessary or even remove my appendix. But even with the modern appliances and drugs, I should be very careful who I choose to be the anaesthetist. Mm -hmm.